This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde. Chapter 6. About ten minutes later, the bell rang for tea, and as Virginia did not come down, Mrs. Otis sent up one of the footmen to tell her. After a little time he returned and said that he could not find Miss Virginia anywhere. As she was in the habit of going out to the garden every evening to get flowers for the dinner-table, Mrs. Otis was not at all alarmed at first. But when six o'clock struck, and Virginia did not appear, she became really agitated and sent the boys out to look for her, while she herself and Mr. Otis searched every room in the house. At half-past six the boys came back and said that they could find no trace of their sister anywhere. They were all now in the greatest state of excitement and did not know what to do, when Mr. Otis suddenly remembered that, some few days before, he had given a band of gypsies permission to camp in the park. He accordingly at once set off for Blackfell Hollow, where he knew they were, accompanied by his eldest son and two of the farm servants. The little Duke of Cheshire, who was perfectly frantic with anxiety, begged hard to be allowed to go too, but Mr. Otis would not allow him, as he was afraid there might be a scuffle. On arriving at the spot, however, he found that the gypsies had gone, and it was evident that their departure had been rather sudden, as the fire was still burning, and some plates were lying on the grass. Having sent off Washington and the two men to scour the district, he ran home, and dispatched telegrams to all the police inspectors in the county, telling them to look out for a little girl who'd been kidnapped by tramps or gypsies. He then ordered his horse to be brought round, and after insisting on his wife and the three boys sitting down to dinner, rode off down the Ascot Road with a groom. He'd hardly, however, gone a couple of miles when he heard somebody galloping after him, and looking round saw the little duke coming up on his pony, with his face very flushed and no hat, "'I'm awfully sorry, Mr. Otis,' gasped out the boy, "'but I can't eat my dinner as long as Virginia is lost. "'Please don't be angry with me. "'If you'd let us be engaged last year, "'there would never have been all this trouble. "'You won't send me back, will you? "'I can't go. "'I won't go.' "'The minister could not help smiling "'at the handsome young scapegrace, "'and was a good deal touched at his devotion to Virginia.' So, leaning down from his horse, he patted him kindly on the shoulders and said, "'Well, Cecil, if you won't go back, I suppose you must come with me. But I must get you a hat at Ascot.' "'Oh, bother my hat! I want Virginia!' cried the little duke, laughing, and they galloped on to the railway station. There Mr. Otis inquired of the station-master if any one answering to the description of Virginia had been seen on the platform, but could get no news of her. The station-master, however, wired up and down the line, and assured him that a strict watch would be kept for her, and after having bought a hat for the little duke from a linen-draper who was just putting up his shutters, Mr. Otis rode off to Bexley, a village about four miles away, which he was told was a well-known haunt of the gypsies, as there was a large common next to it. Here they roused up the rural policeman, but could get no information from him, and after riding all over the common they turned their horses' heads homewards, and reached the chase about eleven o'clock, dead tired and almost heartbroken. They found Washington and the twins waiting for them at the gatehouse with lanterns, as the avenue was very dark. Not the slightest trace of Virginia had been discovered. The gypsies had been caught on Brockley Meadows, but she was not with them, and they had explained their sudden departure by saying that they had mistaken the date of Chawton Fair, and had gone off in a hurry for fear they should be late. Indeed, they had been quite distressed at hearing of Virginia's disappearance, as they were very grateful to Mr. Otis for having allowed them to camp in his park, 
and four of their number had stayed behind to help in the search. The carp pond had been dragged, and the whole chase thoroughly gone over, but without any result. It was evident that, for that night at any rate, Virginia was lost to them, and it was in a state of the deepest depression that Mr. Otis and the boys walked up to the house, the groom following behind with the two horses and a pony. In the hall they found a group of frightened servants, and lying on a sofa in the library was poor Mrs. Otis, almost out of her mind with terror and anxiety, and having her forehead bathed with eau de cologne by the old housekeeper. Mr. Otis at once insisted on her having something to eat, and ordered up supper for the whole party. It was a melancholy meal, as hardly any one spoke, and even the twins were awestruck and subdued, as they were very fond of their sister. When they had finished, Mr. Otis, in spite of the entreaties of the little duke, ordered them all to bed, saying that nothing more could be done that night, and that he would telegraph in the morning to Scotland Yard for some detectives to be sent down immediately. Just as they were passing out of the dining-room, midnight began to boom from the clock-tower, and when the last stroke sounded they heard a crash and a sudden shrill cry. A dreadful peal of thunder shook the house, a strain of unearthly music floated through the air, a panel at the top of the staircase flew back with a loud noise, and out on the landing, looking very pale and white, with a little casket in her hand, stepped Virginia. In a moment they had all rushed up to her, Mrs. Otis clasped her passionately in her arms, the Duke smothered her with violent kisses, and the twins executed a wild war-dance round the group. "'Good heavens, child, where have you been?' said Mr. Otis rather angrily, thinking that she'd been playing some foolish trick on them. "'Cecil and I have been riding all over the country looking for you, and your mother's been frightened to death. You must never play these practical jokes any more.' "'Except on the ghost, except on the ghost!' shrieked the twins as they capered about. "'My own darling, thank God you are found. You must never leave my side again,' murmured Mrs. Otis, as she kissed the trembling child and smoothed the tangled gold of her hair. "'Papa,' said Virginia quietly, "'I have been with the ghost. He is dead, and you must come and see him. He has been very wicked.' but he was really sorry for all that he'd done, and he gave me this box of beautiful jewels before he died. The whole family gazed at her in mute amazement, but she was quite grave and serious, and turning round she led them through the opening in the wainscoting, down a narrow secret corridor, Washington following with a lighted candle, which he'd caught up from the table. Finally they came to a great oak door, studded with rusty nails. When Virginia touched it, it swung back on its heavy hinges, and they found themselves in a little low room, with a vaulted ceiling, and one tiny grated window. Embedded in the wall was a huge iron ring, and chained to it was a gaunt skeleton that was stretched out at full length on the stone floor, and seemed to be trying to grasp with its long fleshless fingers an old-fashioned trencher and ewer that were placed just out of its reach. The jug had evidently once been filled with water, as it was covered inside with green mould. There was nothing on the trencher but a pile of dust. Virginia knelt down beside the skeleton, and, folding her little hands together, began to pray silently, while the rest of the party looked on in wonder at the terrible tragedy whose secret was now disclosed to them. Hallo! suddenly exclaimed one of the twins, who had been looking out of the window to try and discover in what wing of the house the room was situated. Hallo! The old withered almond trees blossomed! I can see the flowers quite plainly in the moonlight. God has forgiven him, said Virginia gravely, as she rose to her feet, 
and a beautiful light seemed to illumine her face. "'What an angel you are!' cried the young duke, and he put his arm round her neck and kissed her. Chapter 7 Four days after these curious incidents, a funeral started from Canterville Chase at about eleven o'clock at night. The hearse was drawn by eight black horses, each of which carried on its head a great tuft of nodding ostrich plumes, and the leaden coffin was covered by a rich purple pall, on which was embroidered in gold the Canterville coat of arms. By the side of the hearse and the coaches walked the servants with lighted torches, and the whole procession was wonderfully impressive. Lord Canterville was the chief mourner, having come up specially from Wales to attend the funeral, and sat in the first carriage along with little Virginia. Then came the United States Minister and his wife, then Washington and the three boys, and in the last carriage was Mrs. Omney. It was generally felt that, as she had been frightened by the ghost for more than fifty years of her life, she had a right to see the last of him. A deep grave had been dug in the corner of the churchyard, just under the old yew tree, and the service was read in the most impressive manner by the Reverend Augustus Dampier. When the ceremony was over, the servants, according to an old custom observed in the Canterville family, extinguished their torches, and as the coffin was being lowered into the grave, Virginia stepped forward and laid on it a large cross made of white and pink almond blossoms. As she did so, the moon came out from behind a cloud and flooded with its silent silver the little churchyard, and from a distant copse a nightingale began to sing. She thought of the ghost's description of the garden of death. Her eyes became dim with tears, and she hardly spoke a word during the drive home. The next morning, before Lord Canterville went up to town, Mr. Otis had an interview with him on the subject of the jewels the ghost had given to Virginia. They were perfectly magnificent, especially a certain ruby necklace with old Venetian setting, which was really a superb specimen of sixteenth-century work, and their value was so great that Mr. Otis felt considerable scruples about allowing his daughter to accept them. "'My lord,' he said, "'I know that in this country Mordmain is held to apply to trinkets as well as to land, and it is quite clear to me that these jewels are, or should be, heirlooms in your family. I must beg you accordingly to take them to London with you, and to regard them simply as a portion of your property, which has been restored to you under certain strange conditions. As for my daughter, she is merely a child, and has as yet, I am glad to say, but little interest in such appurtenances of idle luxury. I am also informed by Mrs. Otis, who, I may say, is no mean authority upon art, having had the privilege of spending several winters in Boston when she was a girl, that these gems are of great monetary worth, and if offered for sale would fetch a tall price. Under these circumstances, Lord Canterville, I feel sure that you will recognize how impossible it would be for me to allow them to remain in the possession of any member of my family. And, indeed, all such vain gauds and toys however suitable or necessary to the dignity of the British aristocracy, would be completely out of place among those who have been brought up on the severe, and I believe immortal, principles of republican simplicity. Perhaps I should mention that Virginia is very anxious that you should allow her to retain the box as a memento of your unfortunate but misguided ancestor, as it is extremely old, and consequently a good deal out of repair, you may perhaps think fit to comply with her request. For my own part, I confess, I am a good deal surprised to find a child of mine expressing sympathy with medievalism in any form, 
and can only account for it by the fact that Virginia was born in one of your London suburbs, shortly after Mrs. Otis had returned from a trip to Athens. Lord Canterville listened very gravely to the worthy minister's speech, pulling his great moustache now and then to hide an involuntary smile, and when Mr. Otis had ended, he shook him cordially by the hand and said, "'My dear sir, your charming little daughter rendered my unlucky ancestor, Sir Simon, a very important service, and I and my family are very much indebted to her for her marvellous courage and pluck. The jewels are clearly hers, and, egad, I believe that if I were heartless enough to take them from her, the wicked old fellow would be out of his grave in a fortnight, leading me the devil of a life. As for their being heirlooms, nothing is an heirloom that is not so mentioned in a will or legal document, and the existence of these jewels has been quite unknown. I assure you I have no more claim on them than your butler, and when Miss Virginia grows up, I dare say she will be pleased to have pretty things to wear. Besides, you forget, Mr. Otis, that you took the furniture and the ghost at a valuation, and anything that belonged to the ghost passed at once into your possession. As, whatever activity Sir Simon may have shown in the corridor at night, in point of law he was really dead and you acquired his property by purchase. Mr. Otis was a good deal distressed at Lord Canterville's refusal, and begged him to reconsider his decision. But the good-natured peer was quite firm, and finally induced the minister to allow his daughter to retain the present the ghost had given her. And when, in the spring of 1890, the young Duchess of Cheshire was presented at the Queen's first drawing-room on the occasion of her marriage, her jewels were the universal theme of admiration. For Virginia received the coronet, which is the reward of all good little American girls, and was married to her boy-lover as soon as he came of age. They were both so charming, and they loved each other so much, that every one was delighted at the match, except the old Marchioness of Dumbleton, who had tried to catch the Duke for one of her seven unmarried daughters, and had given no less than three expensive dinner parties for that purpose, and, strange to say, Mr. Otis himself. Mr. Otis was extremely fond of the young Duke personally, but, theoretically, he objected to titles, and, to use his own words, was not without apprehension, lest, amid the enervating influences of a pleasure-loving aristocracy, the true principles of republican simplicity should be forgotten. His objections, however, were completely overruled, and I believe that when he walked up the aisle of St. George's, Hanover Square, with his daughter leaning on his arm, there was not a prouder man in the whole length and breadth of England. The Duke and Duchess, after the honeymoon was over, went down to Canterville Chase, and on the day after their arrival they walked over in the afternoon to the lonely churchyard by the pine woods. There had been a great deal of difficulty at first about the inscription on Sir Simon's tombstone, but finally it had been decided to engrave on it simply the initials of the old gentleman's name and the verse from the library window. The Duchess had brought with her some lovely roses which she strewed upon the grave, and after they had stood by it for some time they strolled into the ruined chancel of the old abbey. There the Duchess sat down on a fallen pillar, while her husband lay at her feet smoking a cigarette, and looking up at her beautiful eyes. Suddenly he threw his cigarette away, took hold of her hand, and said to her, "'Virginia, 
A wife should have no secrets from her husband. Dear Cecil, I have no secrets from you. Yes, you have, he answered smilingly. You've never told me what happened to you when you were locked up with the ghost. I have never told anyone, Cecil, said Virginia gravely. I know that, but you can tell me. Please don't ask me, Cecil. I cannot tell you. Poor Sir Simon, I owe him a great deal. Yes, don't laugh, Cecil, I really do. He made me see what life is, and what death signifies, and why love is stronger than both. The Duke rose and kissed his wife lovingly. You can have your secret, as long as I have your heart, he murmured. You have always had that, Cecil. And you will tell our children some day, won't you? Virginia blushed. The End of The Canterville Ghost by Oscar Wilde Read for LibriVox by David Barnes